One of the main things that we learn during times like this, when there's looting and violence and discord and divisions in our society, is that we could seem, sometimes I'm afraid we can feel very, very far apart. But in a major way, this is demonstrated by our economy. You will know all about that, the lived experience, our inequality, our racialized inequality. More and more over the last few years, I think there's been this realization, a growing realization around how many people, how many of our people are literally, well, just existing, not able to live, not able to get a proper income. COVID-19 again showing that. Janisha Patel, project leader for inclusive econ econ economies at the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation, joins us. Janisha, I mean, good afternoon to you. We, we all know this. And in fact, we've known this for a long time. It seems our economy is an economy of insiders. And if you're outside it, you cannot become an insider very easily. Yes, absolutely. Good afternoon, Stephen, and good afternoon to your viewers. I think you sort of hit the nail right on the head. Um, South Africa is characterized by extreme inequality, and in fact, one of the most unequal countries in the world. Um, and we found that, you know, this poses a massive threat to social cohesion. In our 2019 South African Reconciliation Barometer, which is a nationally representative um, reconciliation survey that helps to almost measure the national mood, uh, we found that one in three people thought that the gap between the rich and the poor was the greatest threat to social cohesion. But differently, um, inequality is the greatest threat to social cohesion in our country. And, you know, we're really facing what's a three-headed monster here. It's poverty, it's inequality, and it's unemployment. And what we found from consulting with, um, with stakeholders at the grassroots level is that people are feeling a sense of helplessness, hopelessness, and despondency. And this is generally fueled by a lack of opportunities um, and in our reconciliation barometer, again, we found that 42% of people felt that since 1994, the employment opportunities have worsened. Um, and, of course, this has all been further exacerbated by COVID-19 um, and, and the, you know, has sort of created greater desperation among people, especially um, the has not. Um, how has this developed so strongly over time? And I mean... I suppose, and I mean, there's been endless conversations around our inequality. I mean, we know that the roots of it, colonialism and apartheid, and I don't mean that lightly, but we, we do know the roots lie there. The one thing that we know that can equalize a society, or, or I suppose a better phrase, that can provide social mobility, that it can allow someone in any country in the world to come from a poor background to gain wealth and income for themselves and for their children, is, is really education. If you don't get a proper education, it's very difficult. You stay outside. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, there are several, there are several angles to it, um, and I think it's really about access. And I think what access does is it enables people to have economic agency. And what we're seeing um, across the IJR, across the work that we do, is that people are experiencing a sense of depleting agency um, where they feel less in control, whether it's economic agency, social agency, or political agency. But if we are to hone in on economic agency in particular, um, I think that we need to be asking the question, how do we create policies and programs that help us to return agency to people who feel like they're lacking agency? Um, and something that we find is that, you know, we need to help people access um, not just the education they need, of course, the education that's extremely important, but also... Um, the fine, uh, access to financing, um, to networks of people who can help them. And the reason that I, I bring these into the conversation is because in our reconciliation barometer, we find that one in three people feel that they're hindered from achieving their goals or their life aspirations because they lack access to firstly education, to financial resources, to physical areas um, or sort of they struggle to access physical areas where there are economic opportunities. And of course, this uh, this is rooted in apartheid spatial planning, where it's often difficult for people to access areas where there are economic opportunities. And then um, the last barrier of access for inclusivity uh, is networks of people. People feel that they aren't able to access the right sort of people that could help them achieve their goals. And so, you know, we need to be thinking about policies and programs that will return agency to people through allowing them to have access to the things that they believe they need um, in order to fulfill their goals um, and live a prosperous and thriving life. You know, Janisha, I mean, as we, we have this conversation, I'm reminded of a, a conversation I had with a government official 
um, uh, on, at around this time, actually, on this channel about a year ago, uh, as saying, you know, the problem is, and she said, and I, 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 it made me so angry, I'm afraid to say, she said that we think the problem is that young people aren't entrepreneurially minded. I mean, this is coming from a government official. Um, so we're going to teach them entrepreneurship. And I, and I wanted to scream um, at my own TV channel because what you had was a government official saying people aren't getting up and doing it for themselves when actually, I mean, I, I, I imagine I'm of an older generation than you, We've bequeathed them this economy that doesn't work for them, and we've given them nothing to change it with. Uh, no money, um, no proper education, and crucially, you need capital to be an entrepreneur. You can't just say, go and start a business. You need money to do it. And I mean, I, 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 I sort of think sometimes we haven't really thought about this properly, if I may say. Yeah, absolutely. I think that when we're talking about enabling young people to to be more entrepreneurial, and you know that is a big part of the government strategy to build inclusivity, we really do need to think about reducing red tape to accessing finance, financing. Um, you know, helping people to understand what it takes to run a business. Really, um, you know, getting more information out there about the fundamentals of, of what it takes to operate a business. Um, but I think maybe if I can step um, step back from from those nitty gritty things, um, which I think are, are, are over discussed often, and just maybe reflect on on the fact that this is coming from a government official, uh, it it makes me think that, or rather, leads me to, to want to talk about a different layer or um, contextual element that um, perhaps exposed our society to. Um, being vulnerable to being captured by divisive narratives. And, um, you know, so if we move away from the material or the economic aspect and, and maybe look at the social and the political aspect, um, what we're seeing is not only political fracturing, but we're seeing a lack of unity among people. And I think that this is down to um, a trust deficit in our society. And I, I think that in this context, there's two types of trust that are relevant, horizontal trust and vertical trust. And um, when we're talking about vertical trust, what we're really talking about is trust between society and the state. And, you know, that, that sort of comes down to the confidence that people have in their national government, how much they feel they can trust it, and how supported they feel by their national government as well. And we found in our reconciliation barometer that in 2019, only 14.5% of people had confidence in our national government which is, um, you know, it's, it's an alarming, um, alarmingly small figure. And what undermines this, um, this trust, uh, this vertical trust, is corruption, which we know is a pervasive problem for our government, but also the under-delivering from government to people. And, um, and the Afrobarometer, which is another public opinion survey, a pan-African one, found that, that um, only 22% of people were really satisfied with how the government is handling job creation. And so... Um, you know, as much as a government official might be saying that it's up to the people to, you know, be more entrepreneurial, there is also an element where society feels like the state has let them down, and, and we need to take that seriously if we're um, looking to strengthen trust, uh, vertical trust especially, and then also social cohesion more broadly. Janisha, I mean, the problem goes back so far and so long, and I, I sometimes wonder, frankly, if there is much we can do to make major changes, but I'm also reminded that if you create one job and you create income for one person, you're actually creating income for a whole family, five, six, seven people probably. You're changing actually probably 10 lives with one job, which is why it's important to keep going. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that then sort of feeds into another, another type of trust, which is um, horizontal trust. And that means trust among society. It, it, and, and trust among society helps to build unity. It helps to build the sense of that we're in this together. Um, something that came out of consultations with stakeholders is that South Africans are feeling very alone um, in, in their situations. And I think when we see that the people around us are thriving and helping each other, it helps to, to almost amplify a sense of, um, of not only economic inclusion, but social inclusion and trust um, in South Africa. We have a horizontal trust deficit, trust among people, as I said, um, where people tend to trust people that are less similar to them. And so what we found is that um, people trust their relatives the most. 66% of people say they trust their relatives, whereas 45% of people trust their neighbours. And then when we move slightly further away from us, 
we see that only 27% of people trust people from other race groups, and then only around 20% of people trust other foreign um, foreign Africans. And so when we're talking about creating jobs and creating opportunities for others, I think there needs to be a, a, more, a, a broader conversation about national unity and, and how we actually want to to sort of help each other and uplift each other out of, out of the circumstances that we might find ourselves in. Janisha Patel, thank you. Project Leader for Inclusive Economics at the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation. Do appreciate the time. Such an important conversation. Uh, we are